So hello everyone, my name is Kiefer Garena and I am the co-founder of Live Coil Archive, a website dedicated to documenting the concert history of the English electronic experimental band Coil and finding and preserving every live recording made of their concerts. Today I am joined by Mr. Andy Reynolds, uh, the primary live sound engineer for Coil Concerts. Andy, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not primary i was only well two years but yeah thank you thank you anyway well still <laughs> <laughs> a now, significant amount of work yeah i bet it was um one thing that i just want to start off to break off break the ice with yeah. uh i've heard uh some people call you andy ray do you prefer ray or reynolds uh andy ray was just the, the name that it was a nickname through touring so but a lot of people knew me at that time as Andy Ray um that name's gone by the wayside now I guess uh rest in peace huh <laughs> yeah, yeah what got you interested in uh, experimental music and the coil vein was there a certain band that was your gateway into that whole music scene uh not really. I mean, I, you know, I'm a professional or was before the pandemic professional live sound engineer and tour manager. So literally, I just got hired on by Sabine Waltz, their booking agent to well, the first dates, the first set of dates, 2002, as their sound engineer. And then as we went through the second half of 2002 and into 2003, I became their tour manager as well. I was aware of Coil from right back in the day. I had a copy, I think, of Horse Rotovator. I was aware of the of, of their body of work. Before Coil and through Sabine, I toured with quite a few of the New York alternative noise bands such as Swans and Fetus. And that was my interest anyway. I had affinity with that, but as a hired sound engineer one minute you could be doing coil and the next tour you could be doing heavy metal or hip-hop which is all genres i have you know worked for and done live sound for but i was aware of them but i had no idea about the live show yeah so i i know they were contemporaries of fetus jim thurlwell and i think they played a couple of concerts with him um it's funny you mention the whole New York experimental scene, uh, but given what you just said, I assume you didn't see the one show they played in New York. I no, I didn't. I didn't see that one. No, I'm. I remember when I was working with Fetus and we played in London with Coil. They were the, I think. I think it was a co-headlining at the Royal Festival Hall, and um, that's where. And I met Tim. Sutherland has also done live sound for Coil because he was doing Coil and I was doing Jim, but I, I didn't I didn't get to New York to see them. No, unfortunately. That's a shame. Yeah. Uh, Tim is Tim Sutherland. Yes, yeah. I, I just looking around your excellent website, I saw his name and it reminded me because he was he was so friendly, um, and this was after the Coil sound check. And anybody who's been through a Coil sound check, it's either a breeze in the park, a walk in the park or it's a thing and he'd been there and obviously and he still had a smile on his face so I only assume the sound check went well or by that point he was just <laughs> kind of over it but he was so friendly and it was great and it, you know when when the, the engineer for the headliner or whatever is that welcome him to the support band and their engineers it makes the day just breeze along so I always remember him for that yeah that's awesome I've been trying to track him down as well. I've also wanted to talk I, to him. Yeah, I no, I that's the one and only time I've met him. I think. Hmm. Yeah, I that Royal Festival Hall show that you speak of that would have been September of two thousand, and that's when they did their constant shallowness leads to evil uh, uh, yeah. era of shows. That was the first show of that. Yes. Um, do you yeah. remember that whole? massive spectacle because that was the first one with all the light bulbs and the intense strobe lights and everything 
I do remember it. And back to your original question, I forgot that that had been my experience of the live show, doing that show with Jim Fetus. And then we obviously sat around and watched the show. I remember watching it from the side of the stage to start with. And I thought, you know, bugs to this. I need to get out and, and appreciate this. And I, I remember it as I remember the shows that I did with them, uh, the, the fragility of it, you know, the, towards the end to be like, raging raging you know every audio frequency filled but the majority of the set is this just delicate fragility which is especially in a space like that is very hard very brave of an act or you know an artist to try and do that yeah and, and I remember a... banging my head on those light, those light bulbs as well. <laughs> that was the joke throughout the day because they were they were trimmed quite low to give the effect, and there was constant mind your head, mind your head. You know, you, we didn't, obviously you didn't want to bump into them and break them. So yeah, it's funny you say that because there's footage at various shows of uh, the Coil band members doing just that, or like yeah. batting yeah. at them like cats and everything, breaking them on contact exactly. with each yeah. other. I can imagine. Yes. Yes. So did you also meet uh, Coil themselves on that occasion? John Sleazy, Thaipal Sandra, Ossian Brown. And if so, what, were, what was your initial impression of them? Uh, I, we didn't, I don't think we, we really interfaced. Jim might have done, but I was busy. You know, we did our sound check and then I don't even if they know if they stayed in the venue. I mean, traditionally artists leave after their sound check. So, I did not meet them on that occasion. Mm hmm. I see. So you primarily worked with them in 2002, you said, and yeah. um, part of uh, 2003. That's correct, yes. Do you remember uh, what was that initial meeting with them? When and how did you meet them? It, there was no initial meeting. I literally got on a train and went down to Western Supermare, and the tour bus turned up and I met them literally there and then I'd been emailing with Peter and I think we might have had a phone call phone conversation um but no I you know I just got some technical information for I must have had some email and some phone with them but I I met them in person for the first time outside the big house in Western Supermare and we were trying to figure out how we were going to get this tour bus up their drive which we didn't so we had to carry everything down to get in there. And then we had a long journey over to Limoges. Of course. I'm just, I've got the tour itinerary open in front of me. So, yeah, we went from Bristol overnight. And so on the journey over, I kind of got to know them. Yeah, and that whole uh, tour, I believe that was the Anarcadia tour. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know what it was called. But it was, um, yeah, that March on your website from uh, end of March through till April, we finished in in um, Germany, according mm -hmm. to this. Oh, so, and I can, I can clear up a point for you in the October tour where you have a, a question about whether we played two nights in the, sh in the church. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. No, there was only one show. I can, okay, I, can that... put, I can put that one to rest for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no that, that's been kind of a consistent rumor. I think like John Whitney mislabeled it on Brainwashed and that kind of whole kickstarted right. the, right. Right. the confusion. Well, according to my itinerary, and we probably couldn't have done two shows there because there were persistent rumors throughout the day that the church would fall down if I put any more sub bass through the PA. So, oh wow, <laughs> it was it was it was it, it was just it was. In, we're leaping into the future now, but yeah, it, that was an incredible show. Just obviously the setting and then the technical limitations were were quite challenging, but you know, it's that's it was a perfect coil show for that. Mm-hmm. I believe that's one that John John Balance took especially se seriously because on the recordings that we do have, uh, he seems like very sober, very direct, very yes. not yes. maybe not understated, but just like very much in control. Because I I believe Massimo, uh, one of the Black Sun Productions boys, yeah. um, told me once that they were 
told that they couldn't get naked and like do their usual yes. crazy stuff so they yes. wrap themselves up in plastic yes yes yeah i remember that yeah there was there was all sorts of conversations obviously you got a local promoter i mean i can't remember anything about who was behind the concert but with any show you know you you go in and what are the what are the limitations and you know with a four-piece rock band it's usually there's a stage at one end and a pa and you do sound check and you go for dinner and come back and do the show with coil there's a whole planning of where they were going to get changed where they're going to do this how they're going to come on to make them to the impact and you know, in a traditional theatre or club, there's a stage entrance and on the stage. But when you're in a church, it's like, well, how do you do that? So, lots of conversations going on throughout the day. And I remember that. And then the whole no nudity, no blaspheming. Thank you very much. And yeah, some artists might have gone, well, literally boop, that. But you know, John on the day was, oh, you know, okay, we'll, 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 we'll I'll go, I'll go with 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 what's expected. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's also why an unearthly red wasn't played. Probably, yeah. I, I yes, yes, probably. Although I, I, do you think that song is blasphemous at all? I never really saw it that way. It's, it's the perception of the listener always, isn't it? And you know, if we're talking about coil, that was the idea of a lot of it, wasn't it? It was like, what can we push? What is the perception? Are we, are we confronting people? Are we mirroring people? yeah so and that was there literally someone just standing right over you because they threatened to like plug the show immediately if they started doing anything yeah i mean again i can't remember the details and that would have been more like at the stage end obviously if i'm I, i'm out front and i'm i'm mixing um you know i can just i can just put my headphones on if someone comes towards me and say oh, i'm busy mate but i you know there might have been because with the coil show people coming on and off stage there might have been at that end of it i honestly can't remember but it went off without a hitch and you know so that was good yeah awesome and have you heard of the uh professional professionally produced like multi-track mix that by paul sandra released in 2019 of that no time? i haven't no no all right okay i'll have to i'll have to have a listen to that yeah, he uh, released that show and the show from Copenhagen, and they they both sound absolutely fabulous. So I really right. recommend those. Fantastic. Okay, I shall track them down. So coming back to the earlier part of two thousand two with the yes. whole uh, April shows. Yes. What was uh, your first impression of the Anarchadia material? Because like in the first show, there's John and Ossian wearing the white shawls and like jingling the bells and then there's backwards which is um i always interpreted as like john balances um kind of song about coming to terms with homosexuality and stuff like that yeah i mean it was obviously this is my first show with them so i've never mixed them before i don't know you know i've not been in any rehearsals or anything and i remember Peter was quite, he was like the conduit between the, what they were trying to present and then the reality. So he, he obviously realized that I might not be au fait with their current, you know, body of work, what they were trying to achieve. So he was definitely, where well, he spoke to me very practically and down to earth. So it was just about the sound and what they were looking for. Then obviously when the show starts and we have that intro and which I have no idea and I'm back in the audience, you know, 40 meters away trying to figure out what's going on, as is the rest of the crowd. It was just, yeah, it was just like, okay, that's what this is, you know, and, and but immediately it's like, okay, well, do I need to put, you know, for future shows, do I need to put extra mics up to, to so we can hear those bells or is that just part of the, the ambience that's going on? So with all those those first three or four shows it would have been me getting my head around the the audio which is obviously on that tour that's what i was paid to do so my considerations of the show as a spectacle i i would have just not disregarded it but i was definitely not thinking about it i was thinking about the more practical matters of okay this is this is the audio that's coming to me what what am i doing with it yeah yeah 
So I, I, I don't know what I was expecting. Like if there was like a life changing epiphany <laughs> hearing the music for the first time. <laughs> no, I mean, it, absolutely. I mean, every, you know, uh, to be confronted with something like that, which was the cross section of, you know, intense music plus a very structured visual show. It, yeah, obviously it had a, a massive impact upon me and it would have dictated how I then you know prepare the material i mean as a sound engineer i'm not doing anything more you know peter prepared the material and the stuff being played live and all i do is balance it i don't change it in any way but then there's a sensitivity that goes with that especially with jeff's vocals which i learned to pick up on um and definitely by the time i think i'm just looking at the dates here because we had we only had we only had we had one show, then we had another show, and then we had a day off, and then we had another show. So we, we only did three shows in the first week or so. So by the time we got to Italy, I probably would have had a real handle on the, the audio. And that would have been then, you know, informed by what I was seeing on stage. Mm -hmm. Can you remember, uh, I believe it was the Zurich show uh, yeah. where Black Sun Productions joined Coil for the first time yes. and performed. Yes. How yes. does that change the dynamic of the performance, do you think, having the two of them uh, be naked and do like choreography oh. based on their whims? Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, yeah, immeasurably because you could just you could just feel it in the audience. Uh, Rota Fabrique is one of my favourite venues anywhere in the world. Uh, being in Switzerland, they have a sound pressure limit level, which can be quite draconian. You know, if you're if you're trying to seek intensity, but because mm -hmm. I've been there and because Coyle's music is quite dynamic, we didn't have a problem. But it is quiet. It's quiet compared with how you'd run the sound at a typical show. So obviously it's, but the audience is used to that because they go and she see shows there all the time. So for me, I'm thinking this is really quiet. And then we've got two dudes on stage. It's like, wow, you know, and obviously I'd never seen them before. They, they, they were around in the day. It was explained to me they'd be joining on stage, but their whole routine was not shrouded in secrecy, but they obviously needed preparation time before the show so I never saw them basically and then suddenly they are on stage uh doing their performance and the impression the you know the effect on the audience was like wow the, you know this is you could it was palpable because I thought it was really quiet and then suddenly there's another element to it so yeah it was it was and and you then you know I don't know for sure but I'm sure the individual members of coil themselves were like thinking wow this is taking it somewhere yeah as far as i know they they definitely felt that and that's that's why they um kind of regrouped with the band in october of that year yes 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 yeah so um right after zurich was bologna and bologna is kind of a a great gig because we have like a lot of backstage footage of that performance okay. footage of the sound check and everything and watching it the members of coils seem so personable like i believe the footage uh includes them talking to you andy about okay. what they want with sick mirrors which they were debut debuting at right that okay right it's like do you was it were they like very approachable and personable did they like start to run things by you once they got to know you a little bit and stuff absolutely yeah 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 like i said earlier on like peter definitely was like you know not to use the word translator but he definitely knew that my background was as a touring professional was that you know i'm there to do the sound and the certain uh prejudices or conventions that go with that you know the the typical thing about the sound man um and obviously the audio is as with most artists was definitely called important and so as they began to feel comfortable because they hadn't done any live stuff had they before this they i don't they not done well they not done a tour had they had they 
No, that there were four shows in 1983, kind of an unofficial one in 1999, right. but they didn't really get started until 2000 with that Time Machines show right. in April. Yeah. Yeah. And then their first proper tour, I guess, yeah. was with yeah. you, the Anarcadia tour. Yeah. So, you know, to, for an artist to, to step into that and we're playing a variety of different venues and God bless Sabine for, for getting these shows and, you know, in these incredible places plus a mixture of rock clubs. So by the time, yeah, we get to Bologna, it's they're hopefully, I haven't seen this footage, I'll have to check it out, they, but they're hopefully comfortable with how it works on tour, how it works from day to day, and obviously comfortable with my reaction to their suggestions. And the, yeah, friendly, personable. I mean, you know, we're all we're all on a tour bus together, a sleeper bus together. So you know, I always likened it to a a touring student house or a, a frat house that you have in the state. <laughs> you know, it's that it can be that it can go any way on a bus. It can be like sedate and gentlemanly, or it can be just a raging party bus. But you, regardless of the parameters, you're all together. You're all going through the same thing. You're all arguing about who's going to go in the shower first and who didn't close the toilet door and all this stuff. So th those kind of things spill over and, and, and yeah, they were always absolutely 100%. It was just a big, you know, just a big gang of us doing, doing our do. Mm -hmm. Given you say that now I'm wondering, were there any like tour pranks? Did they like play practical uh, jokes? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't remember. Like, I, that, that would be like something that's a real like you know <laughs> coil tour pranks you know can you imagine the youtube video just like five minutes of silence <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> you should do one you should put one up there for for or, um for april fool's day you should find <laughs> seed <laughs> talk or no there, i can honestly say there were no tour pranks with the coil tour and that's the thing i mean you you know you do as you say asking me if i was if it was a life-changing experience with any artist, you do take on the mantle of what they're trying to achieve. And obviously with Coil and seeing the audience, and I'm out in the audience mixing their sound and there's a reverential view from the audience, the certain behavior that then goes with that. You know, I couldn't rock up wearing a Slayer t-shirt when I was going to front of a house or, you know, being all lechy or whatever. It's just because you, you know, you're, you're representing what they are trying to portray so the certain behavior that starts to take place i suppose mm -hmm. absolutely now was it customary for you to make desk audio recordings straight from the pa at all of these shows no because i have a superstition about every time i record a show it's the kiss of death however on the October tour, Peter asked me to find someone to be a sound recordist. And I recruited a student from a, a music industry training place that I was working at part time, a guy called Tom McKinley. And he came along on that October tour and we recorded every show on multi-track. Now yeah. I've seen from your website that obviously when Peter died, all this stuff is you know, lost, archived, locked away or whatever, but we recorded every single show. So I don't know if those are the ones that uh, um, Type or Sandra have released, but I would never ever record a show, especially off the board. Superstition reason and technical reasons. Yeah, I like the equipment wasn't always available. But also the balance when you record something, if you if you're mixing audio for for an artist through a really large, impressive PA, the way that our ears behave in the room with volume and fletcherments and curves and all that stuff is when you listen back to the audio, it sounds it's not flattering. You either get like well, with a traditional band you get kick drum and vocals, with coil you probably just get chords because you're mixing elements into the PA that don't have their own volume. So obviously Jeff's vocal sometimes to to get everything else to get his vocal to sit you have to pull other things back and then you listen to that on a stereo recording and you think where's all the backing gone I mean in, in, in the room on the night it sounded very big and impressive so I just never did desk recordings unless they could be multi-tracks mm-hmm 
It's interesting you say that because I actually have an anecdote to share with you. Um, okay. For the Glaukow show, I believe that was the last one you would have um, done the sound during the Anarcadia tour, April 13th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a, uh, there was a gentleman named Don Rubin who donated the uh, desk recording of that show to Live Coil Archive. And he right. said that he said that he had gotten it uh, as a CDR from Danny Hyde. And yeah. Danny Hyde, I believe I asked him about it once, and he, I believe he said that he got it from you. Oh. Uh, do, do you remember having any contact with Danny Hyde at the, at any point um, post no. doing the concerts? No, no. I don't, I don't. I just remember that place being tiny. That's all I remember. And obviously it's been the last day of the tour and everybody's getting a bit wistful and, you know, a bit... Um, I don't remember anything about doing a, a recording. No, sorry. But obviously no, I did. Okay. Obviously I did because <laughs> there is one. <laughs> this is yeah. the thing. I probably got my arm twisted into it. The PA system probably had some kind of recording thing. And if people come down in the afternoon and go, is it all right for recording? It's obviously they've got to run it by Jeff and Peter first. And then if they say it's okay, then yeah, okay, fill your boots. But I'm not taking any responsibility for how it turns out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder about that because you also must have done a desk recording of the Bologna show because that was officially released on their live album, Live 3. Yeah, yeah. And, so, yeah. Go on. Sorry, carry on. And listening to that CD, it sounds like the first five songs are actually from, taken from like an audience source and then the last four songs are taken from a desk source. So I always assume there must have been some kind of technical issue, which would give credence to you saying... Yeah, yeah. Don't want to make too yeah, many of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I honestly can't remember about the recordings. I mean, uh, what happens sometimes is yes, the venue or the the sound engineer who works for the venue may do a recording, you know, without anybody knowing. That is not unusual. Or then what happens is you know you're asked to listen to it to make sure it's okay, and of course you you're heading off on a bus. You're never going to see these people again, and by the time I get to peter and jeff and say look you need to listen to this because they need authorization it's like well whatever you know do you think it's all right yeah it's all right so and, they, and then consequently the people who put these this material together you know they end up going oh well half of it didn't record and half of this this and it's yeah yeah any any number of problems can arise absolutely absolutely yeah yeah so that last show that you did uh the sound for in april was glaucow they yeah. did play a couple of more shows in the months after that, but you didn't regroup with them until they started playing in Russia, correct? Uh, I think we did. Didn't we do something in Farno or something? Uh, oh yeah, I uh, did that show. Yeah, I did July. that show. Um, yeah, which was which was great. I remember or tech was sound engineer saying, when are they finishing? <laughs> it's like, well, I don't really know. It's a coil show, mate. It's like, you know, you know, the standard thing is you'd have a set list. The artist would give you a set list and you could point to it, go, oh, it's this, this song here. But I think we'd arrived quite late in Farno and, you know, it's a beautiful setting. And I think they'd gone on late because the promoter said it was okay, but obviously all tech wanted to get on and stuff. But yeah, that, that was a good one. That was a really good show. Yeah, that, that was sort of what I call their only transitional show because right. it was kind of between the Anarcadia and the Live 4 set. Right, they, like, yeah. debuted Are You Shivering, Ostia, and The Last Rites of Spring at that show. Yes, definitely. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And then I, I don't know what other shows there were. That, that, oh, I can just let, let me look on your, your site. and then uh... <laughs> There was also a Den Haag and Dower. That doesn't ring any bells for me. Yeah, that that's what I yeah. So yeah, then it would have been into into the October. Um and my we Copenhagen, is that the first one we did? And yeah. According to my tour book we did when did we go to Russia then? Uh uh you guys would have done two shows there at the end of September. Um in Right, uh, yes, yes. Talk at the Taka Club and Vagantka Club for like the Feely uh, right, festival yes. that they had that year. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I remember that because we nearly got electrocuted. The lighting, I saw a picture on your side and I was like, oh, the lighting rig was live 
and every time and it was trimmed down so the guy could put the lights on it and i remember setting up helping sleazy set up his stuff and my head brushed the bar and i got a massive wallop and it was like oh <laughs> you need to sort your electricity out so but yeah they were they, they the the show in moscow i remember being really special yeah I've, I've been trying to find a recording of that first one in Taka for years, man. Right. man. That's I think that's the only one that we now have that there's no audio or video for. Okay, um, right. Yeah. And then uh, I believe, actually, a, a man named Sergei Ivanov uh, made a desk recording of the um, second Russian sh uh, Russia show of that year at um, in Konigsberg. Yes. And he, he said that he gave you the DAT tape at yes. the uh, St. John's Church show, as a matter yeah. of fact. He probably did, and I would have probably given it to Peter, and then therein lies a the tale. You know, if I if I got given something of, of an archive of the, the artist, I would definitely have given it straight back to them. So that's where that one is with the rest of them, I'm afraid, I think. So you never made any personal copies? You don't have any anything? I don't have any recordings no sorry that's yeah, okay <laughs> but you know me of course i had to mm -hmm. ask mm -hmm. at some point <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. no I, the, I mean my like i say my superstition of recordings and yes they do get made and i'm obviously always amenable to them being made but i i wouldn't keep any copies myself gotcha it's it's, it, it's you know, you just listen to it and go, oh, that sounds so bad. What were you doing? Oh, that sounds so... It's, I don't need to self-criticize myself that much. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. I, I feel that way when I go back and read, like, old essays and stuff. Yeah. I, I'm, const <laughs> I'm constantly updating yeah. Live Coil yeah. Archive because yeah. some of that is was written in, like, 2015, and it's like, oh, okay. God, I, I was still right. a child. <laughs> <laughs> it's labor of love it's absolute labor of love i, I was i spent a, a good hour on it the other day obviously looking at the stuff outside the period when i was involved just to almost get a sense of what i was involved in i don't think i was really aware of what i was involved with until we went to russia until that october tour that's when it kind of kicked in i think for me mm -hmm. well let's get into that then um okay. how do you think the live because uh, I kind of call that tour like the live four tour yes. because um, that that's the live album yes. that set of material that they started yes. playing yes. How, do, yeah. how do you think it compares with the Anarcadia tour material in terms of how it made you feel when listening to it I got the impression this this was like as you say this was like a a more thought out slick way of doing things it was it was it was definitely you know programmed to respond to perhaps what the audience wanted you know was it an attempt to not go mainstream but to get more appeal so it was it was it was definitely with the structure was well you you tell me i can't remember but the structure of each night was fairly similar um Jeff's problems notwithstanding, I think there was an attempt to just, you know, make that kind of show that could be repeated, obviously within the confines of improvisation, but so that everybody knew what it was and, you know, you could keep touring it. I think the eye would be to take it back to the UK as a, as a, a more of a formed product without you know with that you're saying p the product word with a very small p interesting yeah and that and that's exactly what they did because they played at the royal festival hall for the third and last time doing yeah. that set of material as well yeah. as the megalithomania yeah. festival yeah. yeah 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 it's funny that i, I saw this in my tour and itinerary and on your website about conway hall and um I honestly, it must have been awful because I have no memory of that show whatsoever. Wow. And I was thinking about people like Keith Richards when they write biographies or autobiographies and they say, oh yeah, this happened. And it's like, how would you know? I mean, I'm not that old and I never went through what he went through and I cannot <laughs> remember anything. I even looked it up on Google Maps to see, do I recognize the outside of it? I, it's, and I know I did it because I've got emails, you know, 
advancing the show with the promoter, but whew, it must have been. You tell me. Well, how how was it? Have you got any recordings of that one? Yeah, uh, there the desk recording was officially released, and we have a couple of audience sources as well. Okay. I know of two video angles, but they haven't surfaced yet. Even right. though I've repeatedly right. begged the one taper I know uh, right. okay. who has it, right. uh, but he he just doesn't want to share at the moment. Right. But okay. You may have blocked it out because it was a very personally strenuous gig. Like you mentioned um, John's problems uh, yes. that he was having on that tour. And I want to yeah. get more into that in a second. Yeah. But like a lot of people think that megalithomania is where John and Sleazy split up romantically. Right. And John, as far as I know, or have been told, just was getting sick of playing live. And so they, they gave them an hour but they only played for 40 minutes because I guess John just wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible. Mm. You don't remember how he had like a little stuffed rabbit toy and he like soundly flogged it over the course of the show, throwing the stuffing into the audience or like oh. running around screaming in people's faces, why are you here? You know? Wow, I have no memory of that whatsoever. It must be a dot. What, when... When was this? What what was the date of this then? October twelfth, two thousand two. Right. So it's before the actual tour then. Yeah, may, yeah. maybe um, it was before you re regrouped with the band. Yeah, no, no, I definitely did it because I've got emails of it. Oh. Um, but I can't remember anything about it. But yeah, I mean, I, I my my. You know, I, I don't, I do, I don't want to go into the personal too much. Obviously, if someone has an addiction problem, and that that addiction will frame their emotional, uh, you know, outlook, going on tour is not the best idea. And if you're having doubts about yourself as an artist, if you're having doubts about how it's being presented, then all these things are going to manifest themselves. And they're going to be polarized. I don't. You know, I don't remember much in the way of antagonism or spats or fallouts with any of the four members on that October tour. It was, you know, it was October. We we're on a bus. It was cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the time again we got back to Austria, but you know, I I, I remember you know the, the the when they we had the couple of days in in stockholm when they went to did that um um workshop and you know it was all it was all you know camaraderie and everybody was everybody was fine it's just you know jeff john was having a really hard time with everything not just with coil yeah um I mean, I remember reports of like him taking DMT in Greece before the Megalithomania show, and he like missed your guys's tour bus to get back home. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. And then at Copenhagen, Thy Paul Sandra remembers that he was unfortunately very drunk, and you can hear it on the recording. It's yeah, yeah, and, and that. A lot. Exactly. And that was a shame because you, you mentioned Are You Shivering, which was my personal favorite. And the, the you know, there's an, the, the articulation and it's just spoken word again, but it's, it's you know, it, it just doesn't work if, if he, when he was slurring and it was real shame. And I think, I don't know if we had some shows where I think I persuaded Peter that they should finish with that. And um, I don't know if that's true, but. I have a yeah, memory. they they did close a couple of concerts. Right, yeah. Shivering. Usually, um, when they couldn't play in an unearthly red, they would close with "Are You Shivering?" Yeah, yes, yeah. And I remember making that suggestion, and and it, and it works because you know when Jeff's vocal was really present, I would take all the effects off, and he would just intone his lines, and then the music would stop, and he'd just say a couple of you know repeat a couple of phrases afterwards. It's absolutely spellbinding doesn't work when you're drunk it just does you know it sounds like a bad pub singer so but you know that's who are we to say the nature of of, of addictions and and what they'll do the guy was in torment you know permanent torment and it's it's not you know it, I, I yeah i'll leave it at that
I'm just surprised it didn't manifest in itself in more spats. I think Peter was very good at keeping me out of things like that. In terms of being a tour manager, sometimes with an artist, you would be responsible for all that. But I think Peter definitely viewed it as a as a you know a couple problem rather than a, a, a musical artist problem. And I I'm unaware of anything like that. I didn't have to deal with you know, the usual things about getting people out of jail or trash hotel rooms, I just wasn't aware. That's probably a good thing when you say Abs I made the absolutely. tour easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and again, I mean, I, I was looking through some old correspondence between me and Peter and talking about bringing the sound recordist, Tom. Tom was a student and we had to do risk assessments and all sorts. And one of the emails from Peter is like, you know, very much, you know, it, it just make sure this guy is aware of our lifestyle, aware of our outlook, aware of our orientation. And then I was saying, yeah, don't worry about it. It's cool. And I've definitely got the impression I remember us thinking about things, how Peter would be very mindful around Tom and myself to a certain extent, you know, that their lifestyle was their lifestyle and they weren't going to enforce it upon anybody. That was for the audience who paid money. You can enforce it upon them because they've made the choice. And, and so a lot of this stuff, yeah, maybe they just, you know, it happened and me and Tom were just blissfully, is a horrible word, but unaware of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for telling me about Tom. I, I had actually never heard about him before, so I'm going to uh, be sure to add that to the website. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. His name's Tom McGinley. I, I have no contact with him since that. He's probably scarred for life, poor black. <laughs> but he, he, did a, he did a bang up job. Like, yeah, Peter was incredibly happy with him. And I'm trying to remember the technology because we wouldn't have had it. We wouldn't, in the emails, Peter's talking about perhaps using a computer with a sound card. Now this is like, you know, 2002, that would have been so expensive. So I seem to think we had an ADAT machine or an HDR24 or something like that with an interface. I know we had a couple of condenser mics to get room sound. And then obviously we were taking, I had a whole bunch of cables. We were taking splits off the board to go straight into the machine. And it was Tom's job to find a space to set it up and do all the recording and all the labeling and everything. And maybe those are the tapes that Thipe or Sandra released. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a digital multi-track? Yeah, it was digital, yeah. It, oh, it, it was, okay. It, yeah, it would have been like a, an, an ADAT machine or an HDR24 or something like that. So uh, my channel list at the time, I, I think it was only like 18 channels, but we recorded everything, yeah. So those those multi-tracks are somewhere. Mm-hmm. By Paul Sandra's closet, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah who, who knows, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what is kind of your standout memory of the Live 4 show? What's like the the most, it like the furthest, or yeah, I'm not right. I'm stumbling did, over my words here, but you know what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. Did they perform Are You Shivering as the last song at the Royal Albert Hall, Royal Festival Hall? Yes, they did. That, that was the one for me, and I remember saying to Peter and I think it was literally before that show or a couple of days before it's like you ought to do that as the last and that was my and I I'm not enthusiastic about it because I you know could take credit for it but that performance and Jeff's voice just drops down to a, I have this memory of it just dropping down to this whisper and him getting really close into the mic so you get a extra bass response proximity effect and it was just mesmer and then of course it just go silent and the lights go down and they go off stage. And I just remember the crowd and I'm going, just going, what the, f you know, it was just one of those. And I, that is, and that is still is my favorite song of, of, of when I listen to Coil, that's the one for me. Cause I love, love that song anyway. And that, that performance. So I suppose with all of Coil, it was trying to get that feeling. The raging stuff is really, it's not easy, but it's because it, every frequency is full. You know, you just sit there and you just let it do its do. You're almost like riding a tsunami. But it's that, as I said at the beginning, it's that fragility of those shows and in the right room with the right PA and when all the performance was going off and the lighting was good. It's just like, you know, it's like uh, you really are part of something. And for the audiences, you know, I, you know, I imagine some people 
definitely had their lives changed forever when they went to see Coil live in that in that year. Yeah. So being a fan of Horse Rotovator, were you excited when they played like Slur during the Arcadia <laughs> yeah. shows and Ostia during the live Well, this is it. I mean, and that's the thing without being a real fanboy or unaware of an artist canon. It's like, you know, when when they mentioned the games, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I kind of vaguely know that one because I was just, I was unfamiliar with any of the stuff that they they played. As I say, you know, I met them for the first time and seeing them at the Royal Festival Hall, but wasn't, I had no rehearsal to go to, so yeah, hearing something that I vaguely knew was 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 great. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. So their their final show of the October tour um, was uh, in Vienna at yep. the tail end. Now they had uh, kind of hinted previously that they were going to do two more Italy shows at the beginning of November, but apparently they got cancelled do you do you remember why that was this i was looking i've got a load of emails and it was just it, they, at that point there were uh you know peter you know just says glibly in emails that they've, they've fallen out with this person they've fallen out with this person and it just seems to be that the these differences not irreconcilable but just there were this logistical differences that then meant that you know they couldn't do stuff like for instance uh in one email you know someone's fallen out with someone who's going to drive a van but that can't happen now so i think peter was just like having to organize everything sabine could get them the shows whether she could get the fees to cover what they wanted to do and then the just the logistics and i know I, I know Pete, peter a couple of times was just you know he was just weary of that kind of trying to get everybody and everything in one place to do to do what they were doing but he made it happen he made they all made it happen all four of them made it happen again and again and again and again and so it's you know quite a force to be reckoned with and it, it by the end of that october tour it was definitely a you know we were a, a finely oiled machine you know sound checks were a breeze and we had no equipment problems and tom was recording everything the visuals worked so and dealing with completely different spaces you know going from churches to tiny clubs to the place we played in woods was like a, a you know a, a village a modern village hall no atmosphere whatsoever plain white walls plain ceiling you know and it was <laughs> it's like you go from a church to this like civic center it was bizarre but they did it yeah, it was always strange to me that they they would play in all these bizarre places that you would just never expect them to. Mm, mm, mm. I think a lot of that is driven by local promoters, people who want to put the show on, and you know those are the spaces that are available to them. The mainstream promoters obviously wouldn't just consider it that they wouldn't make enough money to perhaps put them on. And as we discussed before, perhaps this tour was a way of creating a package that then Sabine could go and sell back to some of the more mainstream promoters. Yeah, that would make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, did you know it, w it was going to be the end there? No, no, not at all. No, you, you, you know. Oh, they just sprung it on you? <laughs> uh, well, I don't think there was any discussion. It was just like... Yeah. You know, you have to remember I was a touring professional. I probably, if there was nothing in the diary with them, I would probably be doing something else. I was looking at some calendars. I think I went on from this to do something else. And and so you just wait for the email to come. All right, there's another talk from either Sabine or Peter saying, you know, we've got these dates. Are you available? And and then that's the way it goes. So there was no there was no sense of right. That's that's the end of that. It was just okay. I'll see you. See you next whenever kind of thing. I gotcha. Uh, one more question about that tour. Um, was the Stockholm show, was that really a surprise gig? Yeah, because I've got it in my thing as off, you know, travel off. Um, three, so, yeah, we must have been, yeah, we are, yeah, because it's not an official itinerary that I got from Sabine. So, yes, definitely. Gotcha. That's, yeah. a, that's another one that we're yeah. <laughs> trying to find a foolish yeah. recording. 
yeah yeah okay okay so yeah the tour ends and as far as i can tell the coil camp was relatively quiet for the next six months until uh the all tomorrow all tomorrow's parties show. oh yes yes did yes. you do the sound for that one i did indeed yeah that was an epic gig i mean the whole all tomorrow's parties set up anyway to have that amount of completely diverse music all in one place i've done it several times with with various artists and that site canva is it's just a trip you know it really is you're in this holiday camp <laughs> with the kiddie swings and and then you've got loads of really intense music dudes wandering around and it's fantastic because everybody's in together all the artists all the audience are all in chalets together everybody's wandering around and and that gig i've seen someone's posted some really quite good footage haven't they on youtube anthony child yeah. right okay so i remember watching it a couple of years ago and uh yeah it was a great absolutely great show oh yeah could you get what was the the feeling amongst the band members at that particular show i i couldn't say for sure whenever you do a one-off show there's always a lot of stress, a lot of strain. You know, you haven't worked for ages. Peter's probably been doing whatever he's doing. Jeff's probably been doing what he's doing. Then to get everybody else together, are you available? Are you going to rehearse? What time are you getting there? What... So it, you can't, I don't think you can ever judge what, you know, in this case, whether there was any animosity or whatever, because it's just stress. And it's also a festival you know and a bit more laid back than an open air greenfield festival but even so you've got a certain amount of time to get on uh did we do a sound check i can't even remember if we did a sound check the pa engineers on monitors and what's called babysitter for me from the house could give less than a shit about this music they absolutely hated it and i remember having to tell the from the house guy behind me to shut up because he was just waffling all the way through the set which is really quiet and fragile about you know what a bunch of muppets they all are so you've got you've got this clash where people just aren't they're not in tune with with the artistic vision of the of the music of the day. So I couldn't I remember being really stressful. I missed my train, I had to get a taxi, which cost a million pounds. <laughs> Peter's really cool about it. He's just like, Don't worry, just get here, just get here, we need you, just get here. Because I think I'd volunteered in answer to your question, I don't know if there was anything going on personally because it was just stress but it was a great show it was an absolutely great show that room was full and it was like one of those times again where you just think whoa i'm part of something here mm -hmm. you were most definitely yeah yeah and thank goodness you recorded the desk recording <laughs> yeah yeah that was that uh, yeah I, I i can't remember you tell me i don't know who it was but someone no, you tell me. I don't know. Who, I don't know where I got the. Someone. I remember someone coming and said, "We we're going to record it." It must have been the festival itself. Did they record it? Or. Uh, well, if you didn't, then I'm not sure who did. Right, yeah. I, I just know that they later officially released um, yeah. Yeah. The recording. Yeah, there was a there was there was a recording set up from the house, and you know, obviously you you asked the artist for their permission, and 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 yeah, we, I remember doing that. And it, it's just a personal thing as soon as i see like you know a dat machine blinking away i just think oh it's just gonna all gonna go wrong it's a kiss of death but luckily it wasn't mm -hmm. and it was the only time that they ever played like that that proper set that they did dreamer yes. is still asleep yeah. and yes. asleep slip in the marl bone road yeah yeah no it was yeah it was uh, i'm gonna go and watch it again after this i think it was great <laughs> it, was really, it was really good and then the beauty of something like that is you know you do your set and you're on and off and then we pack down i remember going back to the chalet to drop off the equipment and peter saying what you're doing now and i was like, just gonna mooch around and you know look at some mans and they said well that's what we're gonna do and it was really nice just to have that time together just i can't remember what we we checked out um obviously going anywhere with peter and jeff you'd walk about three steps and then you'd be in a conversation with a whole bunch of people. Then you'd walk another three steps. And, you know, so, you know, it's, it was, it was, it was great to see them just, and that's the beauty about doing something like that. Everybody's in it together and there's no, you know, it just breaks down the walls of it. It's quite, quite, quite enjoyable. And I bet John would have drawn a crowd just from the dress that he was wearing alone. Yeah. 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 
and we were on so early as well i have this i have this memory of that we were on quite late at night but we were it was like 3 30 in the afternoon or something was oh, it wow I, i've got I, i've got the tour schedules here and i was looking at it again really but yeah yeah that that set would, would have definitely suited yes to be played at night because yeah. it is like the closest they did to like music to play in the dark yeah arguably. absolutely yeah yeah uh we were on where, i'm just looking there uh, where is it uh, we were oh no well 6 15 till 7 15 we were on before jim o'rourke so there was a nice uh, no after jim o'rourke and uh, before bernard parmigiani yeah it was great yeah i love it so that was john balance's only public performance in 2003 um, right did you also do the sound for any of the instrumental shows that uh, Peter or Sleazy and Five Paul Sandra did later that year? No, I didn't because I think I was, I remember looking at when we first got in contact, I was looking at my diary. I went off to do another tour, which took me all through November and December. Um, so that, that was, yeah, I think that was, that was my time with Coil, wasn't it? Unfortunately. It sounds like it. Yeah. And you never, you didn't stay in contact. You didn't see any of their shows in 2004 or anything. No, I remember speaking to Peter and Sabine about stuff. And obviously there was a conversation when the throbbing gristle uh, thing happened that I might do that, but that didn't come to anything. Um, I remember emailing Peter just every now and then. I think, you know, I was interested to see what was going to become of the recordings. I've got some, some emails that are printed out and, that would have been early 2004 and then we uh, unfortunately lost contact and the next thing I know I heard that Jeff had died and then after that and I remember sending trying to send Peter an email at that time and then I withdrew it because I just thought you can't I can't send this thing by email uh, and then I heard that Peter had died mm-hmm Terrible stuff. I, I, I talk yeah. to people all the time. People are still especially devastated by Peter's yeah. death to this yeah. day because he would, everyone who knew him loved him to pieces. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and he was, he was, he, you know, he was that real, that real conduit between the coil world and the rest of the world. And so down to earth, like, like they lived in Western Supermare, which I don't know if, you know, geographically is a long way from London. It's quite difficult to get to. And they didn't drive, they didn't own a car. And I was saying, well, how, they were in London all the time. And I said, well, how do you get there? And they say, well, we get a taxi. And I was going, taxi, that's 200 pounds. And Peter was like, you know, add up the cost of owning a car for a year and parking and petrol and stuff, 200 pounds two times a year is nothing and it's like yeah absolutely right you're totally you're totally on it dude that's amazing i thought he would have said something much more like uh like oh i'm so luxurious i can just <laughs> <laughs> when you say that luxurious thing he he never that may be an, an, an image or something but he never came across like that to me that was jeff's you know jeff's preserve was like the not you know not in a a, a deaverish way but he was the artist he was the, he was he was the the mouthpiece and the words came through him but i always found peter just be this like totally stoic down the line dude and then just happened to get on stage and make this most tripped out music and he was like you know wow wait, is that the same guy really is that... it's a shame you couldn't do retg although that's a whole other can of worms like that event got like cancelled like three times before they just like put yes. on like a recording session that an audience could attend yeah finally yeah. in like may 2004 did you go to that show no i didn't no i i mean i i've not been to a lot of things because obviously just touring i was touring myself you know for 25 years and so missed so much stuff um but yeah uh, it, yeah and yeah okay yeah yeah so today in 2020 are you in contact with anyone in the co coil sphere from those days no but i did see the oh what's his name is it mike who was on the first tour that he's now playing in a band with steve davis the who is a uk soccer uh, snooker player 
And anybody of my age growing up knows Steve Davis as being a world champion snooker player. And Steve is a music man, uh, definitely into his prog rock. And he's formed this excellent band. And I can't remember the name of them. Do you, do you know? Uh, uh, Mike. Are you, talking, are you talking about Michael York, the dude who plays yes. the Breton bagpipes? That's right, music? yes. And he's in this band with with Steve Davis, and I I love their album, but I I I've not been in contact. I thought about dropping them an email, but uh, but so that's that was it. That's my only connection. I saw it in a magazine a couple of months ago. I was like, all oh, right, okay. But no, I I I'm really bad at keeping in touch with people that I've uh, worked with or for, and it's such a weird thing because it's such a camaraderie based activity. As I said, you're all in this. Thing together, and as soon as I finish working, I'm just like off in my own, my own world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael York and Cliff Stapleton, the hurdy gurdy player, were a part of the Anarcadia tour. I, I That's right. yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I meant to mention them before. Did did you ever talk to them? Were they? Yeah, yeah. Guys? Well, this, yeah, we. You know, I mean, that was my. Like I say, that first time I met Jeff and Peter, I mean, I met. Michael and, and, and Cliff, is it beforehand? We were in the bus waiting for them to get their final bit of packing together. And, and obviously I didn't realize, I knew they weren't like, they weren't coil. They were session musicians, if you like, but I didn't realize what they were going to play. And when Hurdy Gurdy was mentioned, it's like, ah, I don't think I've ever mic'd up a hurdy gurdy before. <laughs> so that was a bit of a learning curve. But, you know, obviously they're professionals. They say, well, the, you should probably do this and do this. And all this stuff we worked out at that first show. So it was quite, quite, quite interesting. Absolutely. Well, I think that's about all the subjects that I wanted to cover. Do you okay. have any closing thoughts? Anything else you want to? tell me about no I, i'm just I'm, I'm grateful that you 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 got in touch it's it, it was definitely when i saw your website and then looking through the files that i've still got it was a definitely a trip down memory lane and, and like i said a couple of times during this interview it's just to be part of some things like some of those shows for me yeah um was something and i, I definitely know for audience members it must have really been just something to that they'll always always remember yeah and and speaking of your archives like uh if it's all private i completely understand but if there are, is like any like business emails that you think would add to the archive i would be okay, right. very grateful to okay yeah yeah I'll, I'll i'll have a look through and I'll, I'll forward you anything i think's not too personal <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you i would really be grateful for that no worries no worries all right. Well, yeah. Th thanks very much, and, and and best of luck. It's a it's a real labor of love you're uh, you're on with there. Oh yeah, I I love it. There's been a lot of joy and a lot of tears shed over the yeah, past I, couple I, of years, but I can it's imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. They're a part of my life, and that's, probably are going to be for the rest of it. So that, that's yeah. that's good. That's that's Got, a good thing. A good thing to have. Got to do my part for them, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Andy. I really appreciate it. And it was really nice to meet you. And you, you take care. Stay warm out there. <laughs> I will, I will, yes, yes. All right, there we have it. Thank you very much once again to Andy. And my name is Kiefer Garena. I am a part of Live Coil Archive. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed.